Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. My first time here, it's a great place. Uh, this is joint work with my former student, uh, Dima Spiegelman. And uh, let me begin with the physics. So the physics that uh, we have here is a laser beam that propagates in the Z direction through some transparent medium, air, glass, water, whatever. Uh, direction of propagation is Z. It enters uh, the nonlinear medium here uh, is it starts at Z equals zero. And the equation of propagation uh, to leading order is a two-dimensional cubic NLS. Uh, so here we have the diffraction terms, which tries to make the beam wider with propagation, but we have the nonlinearity here, the Kerr nonlinearity, which tries to make the beam narrower with propagation. So we have this competition between focusing uh, nonlinearity and diffraction, and uh, and uh, the, we impose the initial beam profile at z equals zero. So this is our initial condition, and the propagation is in z. So this is an initial value problem in z. But since this is a mathematical audience, most of the talk I'll call this t uh, to make it uh, life easier. But there are some z's that were left behind in the transparency. So wherever you see z, it's t. Uh, Okay, so you have this competition between the focusing nonlinearity and diffraction. And actually, this field started from experiments which were done in the early 60s. By that time, you had powerful lasers. So one of the experiment people shown these powerful lasers into glass. And what they show is that after some propagation in the glass, the be actually the, the laser beam became narrower so much that it damaged the, the glass. So it was really damaging glass. So they call this optical collapse or catastrophic collapse. And the first explanation was given in 65 by Kelly, who used the 2D cubic NLS, and he showed numerically and uh, hand wavingly that a solution of this equation can become finite in a, can blow up in finite time, which of course physically is finite distance. So there's a lot to say about the blow up of solution and there are many experts in this audience and whatever I had to say about it, I said in this book, but today I'm not going to talk about blow up. I'm going to talk about solitary waves. Uh, so what do we mean by solitary wave? We look for physically this are solution that propagate in the Z direction without changing the radial profile. So this is the well-known equation for the profile of these solutions. And uh, the dependence on this mu parameter is only through the dilation, so it really doesn't play an important role here. And uh, we are always in the 2D cubic case in this talk. So we're only talking about L2 critical. And uh, therefore, the power or the L2 norm of R mu is independent of this parameter. And I call it a power and not L2 norm or mass because in optics, this quantity corresponds to the power of the laser beam, how many watts or megawatts it has. <coughs> okay, so here is this uh, R equation. It has been studied extensively. There is an infinite number of solutions, radial solution. The one we usually care about is the ground states, which physicists would call the town's profile. Uh, it's positive, monotonically decreasing, and it has exactly the critical power for collapse. And if you plot it, it has a peak, uh, this is R, so it has a single peak at the origin. And I use here a notation which is slightly different. Usually people denote this solution by R0. I call it R1 because in this talk, the superscript would always denote the number of peaks of the solution, and this solution has one peak, so that's why I call it R1. So what do we know about this solution, uh, this solitary wave? If you take an initial condition, this initial condition multiplied by C, if C is larger than 1, then your solution blows up in finite time, whereas if C is less than 1, then you have scattering as t goes to infinity. And therefore, this solitary wave is 
has sort of a dual instability. If you perturb it to either direction, it won't stay. And so this is uh, maybe trivial mathematically, but physically this is a very bad news. Because what you want physically is to be able to take a laser like this and shine it, let's say, to several kilometers into the atmosphere uh, and have it uh, in a stable way. How would you have it stable when I just proved that the solitary wave is unstable? So this is a very important problem. How can we stabilize laser beams when they propagate in bulk medium. Uh, it's extremely hot, extremely important problem, uh, a, lo a lot because of this atmospheric propagation, but not just because of that. So one very intriguing idea was proposed in 98, and that was to use a necklace beam. So what is a necklace beam? You take an initial condition, and this, uh, so it's a setch, uh, a shifted setch in the R direction, multiply by cos and m theta. So here is the plot of this solution. It has two m uh, roughly beams, which are called pearls to correspond with this uh, necklace. Uh, Segev always has very illustrative uh, names. And uh, they are at equal distance from each other. They are all on a radius of r max. And uh, adjacent pearls have opposite signs, so opposite phases. And why use this configuration? Because if you look on these rays between each two pearls, Psi naught is zero on this uh, rays, and by uniqueness, Psi remains zero along these rays. And therefore, if you look on just one pearl, as far as these pearls uh, see in its dynamics, it only sees these two Dirichlet boundary conditions on this ray. So it doesn't feel at all the other pearls because uh, a Dirichlet boundary condition is a reflecting boundary condition. Everything that comes to the boundary gets reflected. And so the necklace structure would be preserved at all times. And the way a physicist would tell you, he would not tell you this uh, using a Dirichlet boundary condition. What he would tell you is that if you have two beams of opposite phase, they repel each other and that's why they don't interact. So here is again our necklace beam. So what was Segev's idea? Let's take each pearl and give it power, L to norm, slightly below the critical power for collapse. If it's slightly below, it means that the nonlinearity is slightly weaker than diffraction. So it cannot collapse by itself, so it wants to expand slowly. But as it tries to expand, it starts feeling the repulsion by the nearby uh, pearls, and so this would slow down the expansion of each pearl. So just to show this numerically, here we did a simulation. We have a pearl with just a, a ring with four pearls. Here you cannot see that they have opposite phases because I plot the intensity, but they have. And this is the dynamics as Z, which is T, goes on. You see it expands, it keeps the necklace structure. But if you just would take just one of these pearls, it would expand much faster uh, at the same time. So indeed, this slows down the expansion. So its uh, expansion is much slower than for a single beam, and sometimes this may be enough for your application, but ultimately this structure either, again, would scatter or collapse in finite time. And this is an experiment which came eight years later. This was done at uh, Cornell by Gaeta's group. Uh, and here what the, you see is you see an input beam. This is a necklace. Uh, they have opposite phases. <coughs> and this is the input beam. And this is after propagation <coughs> of 30 centimeters in glass. You see the necklace structure is preserved now. The question whether this is stable, uh, well, it depends if you're a mathematician or a physicist. For a physicist, this is stability. For a mathematician, I'm not sure. But this uh, necklace structure is actually even being used as a mean, not just as the end. For example, in this recent paper, they, use, uh, they set up a necklace beam structure, which you see here, in order to set up a thermal wave guide in air. So sometimes you don't care by the next if itself, but you use it to do other purposes. 
And let me uh, point out that it may look like this is a vortex beam, but it's not. Because a, a vortex beam is something like this times e to the i m theta. And when you have a vortex beam and you plot the amplitude, it's radial. The necklace beam is non-radial. So it's, it's different from vortex beam. Okay, so can we have necklace solitary wave in free space, in two dimension? The answer is no. Uh, if you take the 2D cubic NLS, it does not admit necklace solitary waves. And by this, what I mean is if you take this R equation and you look for a solution of this form, there's no such solution. Now I put it in formal proof because we have sort of a, 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 a arguments that probably could be made into a rigorous proof, but it's not rigorous. But I believe it's correct. Uh, actually, there have been a proof of the existence of sort of uh, multi-peak science-changing solutions of the R equation in these two papers. But there they have a very uh, complex construction. They have two, uh, two rings, one inside of the other. It, it's not of this form that we have here. So they are multi-peak sign-changing solutions, but not of this form. And uh, anyway, whatever you get here would be strongly unstable because any solution, any solitary wave of the 2D critical would be strongly unstable. And now there have been observation of necklace solitary waves with a different nonlinearity. This is in a photorefractive material where you have this type of nonlinearity here, and you have here some potential which you induce with another laser, another laser beam. So, in this kind of a, a type of NLS, you can show that there exists a necklace solitary waves and that they are even in some parameter range they are stable and this was shown theoretically, numerically, experimentally. There's only one problem. Uh, the medium that we usually take are not photorefractive. We want air, we want uh, glass, we want water. It's care, it's not photorefractive. So what can we do? Our goal is to stabilize a necklace beam in a care medium. So one idea, which has been used since, I think, like 20, 30 years, has been to confine the laser beam to a hollow core fiber. What is a hollow core fiber? You have a fiber, it's empty here in the inside, and you put some uh, nonlinear material, which can be air or it can be some uh, noble gas. So it has a cubic nonlinearity. That's what we care about. And to leading order, when you propagate here, the walls are completely reflecting. Everything that hits the wall can, comes back in. And therefore, if you write the equation for the propagation, it's the 2D cubic NLS. But now it's not in free space. It's confined to some region, the cross section of the fiber, which typically it would be the unit disk, although there are other shapes of hollow fibers available in the experimentally. So this brings us to the issue of the NLS on a bounded domain. So uh, here is our equation. We put this directionally boundary condition for uh, reflecting boundaries. You can again look for solitary waves. So they satisfy the R equation on a bounded domain. And uh, this equation uh, was studied by Frank and myself in, two in 2001, and later there have been some other studies of this equation. These studies were mostly on radial solutions on B1. Well, did I'll summarize these studies into one slide. Uh, so the important thing to note here is that we don't have the dilation symmetry anymore because of the Dirichle boundary condition. And this changes everything. So for example, if you look on the power now, it, it does depend on mu. It's not independent of this mu. Uh, mu starts from mu linear, which is the eigenvalue of the linear R equation, the smallest eigenvalue. 
Uh, and then uh, from here, the, same, uh, the power increases until it reaches the critical power as mu goes to infinity. And let's know that the power is increasing as a function of mu. What about stability in general? So if you want to study the stabilities of solitary waves, the easiest type of stability is linear stability. So you perturb this R mu with a perturbation, which has a, a real and imaginary part and some eigenvalue omega. You put it into the equation, you write the linearized equation, you get this well-known system with L plus and L minus, which are defined here. And what you want to know for stability is whether you have eigenvalues uh, with positive real part, because if you do, then you have unstable modes. And what uh, was shown, I believe, first by Vachitov and Kolokolov, that actually instead of studying this eigenvalue problem, you can replace it with a much simpler thing. So if you, you look on a positive solution, then uh, you have linear stability if the power is monotonically decreasing in mu. So this is, if you look in the physics literature, this would be called the vachitov kolokolov or the Fikai condition for stability. And actually, this condition is not only sufficient for linear stability, it's also sufficient for orbital stability. Uh, now, on the unit disk, we see numerically that this V condition, VK condition is indeed satisfied. The power is increasing as a function of mu. And this leads to the following theorem, that if you look on the grounded solitary states on the unit disk, they are uh, orbitally stable. And when we talk orbitally stable, on the bounded domain, we mean stability up till uh, phase changes of uh, the solution. And this is very different from free space. In free space, these solitary waves are unstable in the 2D cubic case. So the boundary, the, reflect, the, the reflecting boundary is stabilizing the solitary waves. And this is a general result. A Dirichlet boundary condition has a stabilizing effect on solitary waves. So that's the good news. The bad news is that if you look on the power of these solitary waves, it goes between zero and P critical. So the most we can uh, propagate in a stable way would be uh, slightly below critical. Slightly below because this is an experiment. You, you don't have exactly the profile, there's always some noise. Let's say 80, 90% to be a critical power. We want to be able to propagate much more than that. So how would you do that? So one, uh, we were trying to think of different ways to do it, and one idea that came to mind is to use a necklace solitary wave, because, well, if each one of these would have slightly below critical power together, wow, you'll get much more. So that, that was the motivation for studying this, the physical motivation for studying this necklace solitary waves. But what do we mean by a necklace solitary wave? So uh, we have this R equation on a bounded domain, and we can, of course, take a, a circular fiber, and then uh, the, the necklace uh, solitary wave would look something like this, with a plus, minus, plus, minus. But we can start a well mathematician. We can play with, the, uh, play with the domain, so we can take a rectangle, maybe, and having a necklace solitary wave of this form, or maybe even an annulus, and have something of this form. And with fabrication techniques today, any shape basically can be fabricated if there is enough uh, motivation. As far as I know, these solitary waves were not, uh, did not appear before in the literature, and they are new. So let's start with the rectangular one, because they are easiest for the analysis. So uh, we want to compute them numerically. How would we do this? Uh, we would just compute one pearl first numerically on a square. So this would be a positive or a ground state solution on the pearl. And then we would extend it to a necklace by putting them one next to the other. So this brings us the 
to the question of how do we compute a single pearl, a single positive solution, ground set solution of the R equation on a square. Uh, this is not very challenging numerically, if you know which method to use, which is this uh, uh, renormalization method. You just need to use some non-spectral version. If I have time at the end, I'll talk about it, and if not, it's all in the paper. But here are the results. So uh, these are the solitary wave for different values of mu. This is the power as a function of mu. So you start from mu linear as before, the linear, the eigenvalue of the linear uh, problem, linear R equation. And as you bifurcate from uh, this mu linear, you are in the weakly nonlinear regime. So here, what mainly supports the solitary wave is the, f uh, is the boundary. But as uh, you increase mu, you go to the strongly nonlinear regime where you are almost like in free space, you hardly feel the boundary, so you are almost like this. And uh, since we'll care about stability, let's know that the VK condition is satisfied. Okay, so we know how to compute one pearl, and now we want to make a necklace out of it, so we just put them one next to the other, plus, minus, plus, minus. And uh, this indeed gives you an honest solution of the R equation with a necklace structure. So the only th so on these interfaces, R is uh, zero. And the only thing that you have to check is that indeed the equation is also satisfied with this interface, but it does, so it's fine. It's an honest uh, necklace solution of the R equation. But uh, you can start getting crazy. For example, you can put them in this form, and this would also be a solution, uh, a necklace solution of the R equation. So you can play with the shape as you like. Okay, what about circular necklaces? So we take the R equation now on a circle, Dirichlet boundary condition. So again, we need to first compute one pearl. So for example, let's have it on the quarter circle. So you do the same technique, same numerical method, and here is a very similar picture. This is the weakly nonlinear regime, uh, low and wide, the strongly nonlinear regime, uh, narrow and high. Here you are close to free space. This is very linear, and the VK condition is satisfied. And once you have one pearl, you put them next to the other, and you get your necklace. I have, a, I have a question, if I'm allowed, which is, on one sector, is it possible to get a sign-changing condition? That is, one up and one down. So my definition is that I would take a sector that I would have only one. Uh, my numerical method can only compute positive solutions. So I would always look for one pearl and then extend it. Right. But it's not impossible. Uh, you mean numerically or... Uh, well, so uh, call all this a sector, and then you'll get uh, two signs, right? Well, I was thinking of a thin sector and have them differing radially. Ah, different radially. Ah. And then you, so it's not so symmetric, and you put together more, something with two pearl rings, for example. I don't know. I need the destruct, I need the, uh, for, for my numerical method, I need to be able to impose this Dirichlet boundary condition, so I need to know where they are. And if you put this there or two there, it's not clear to me where you would have the... If you tell me where is the boundary, then I'll be able to compute it. Okay. Not, yet. not yet. Okay, and about the annulus, so again, we do the same procedure. We compute a, a single pearl, a positive solution on the sector of the annulus. And again, the same behavior, the weakly nonlinear regime, the strongly nonlinear regime, the VK condition is satisfied. And once we, we know them, we just put them one next to the other and we get a necklace solitary wave. So this brings us to the issue of stability. <coughs> uh, so when we talk about stability here, the we first should start with stability of a single pearl and only then move to stability of a necklace. So when we talk about a single pearl, uh, 
So here, for example, you have the square, the quarter circle, and the quarter annulus. And we take the initial condition is we take this and we multiply it by 1.05. And here is what you have after t, t equal 10. It looks almost the same. And in all the numerics we have done, we always see that this uh, positive solution on bounded domains are, are, uh, are stable. And it, it agrees with the fact that they all satisfy the VK condition. So this, again, it's not a rigorous statement, but it's a numerical observation. But what about the necklace stability? Well, it depends what type of perturbation you put. If you would multiply everything by 1.05, for example, like we did previously, then uh, actually Psi would remain zero on these interfaces because you don't change it in the initial condition. And you, uh, the more important thing is that you, you maintain the anti-symmetries between these uh, pairs. And therefore, Psi would remain zero on these interfaces, and so, so the pearls would not speak with each other. So the stability of the whole necklace is the same as the stability of the single pearl. So if you have any chance of destabilizing a necklace, is to use a perturbation that would break this anti-symmetry of the necklace. So there are various ways that you can break this anti-symmetry with respect to uh, these interfaces, one possibility is you just add noise. Another one which we usually prefer is to check just one of the pearls and multiply it by 1.05. And the reason I mainly prefer this to this is because this is a deterministic perturbation. You can trust the numeric much more when you do a deterministic perturbation than when you do a random one. Okay. So uh, what about the VK condition? Well, since each one of the pearls satisfies the, the VK condition and the power of the necklace is n times the power of the, of the, is the number of pearls times the power of each pearl, then the VK condition would also be satisfied uh, for a necklace. But this doesn't mean that the necklace is stable because uh, the VK condition is good when you have a positive solution. Now this is not a positive solution anymore, the necklace. So therefore you need to go back to the original derivation of this VK condition, which is, uh, and let's do just the linear stability. So you look, go back again to this system with the L plus, L minus, this uh, uh, linearized uh, equation for the perturbation of the ground of the solitary waves, and you want to check whether there are some eigenvalues with positive real part. So let me show you the result of this computation for the case of a circular necklace with four pearls. So what we plot here, this is the value of mu as we change it. And we plot here real of omega, so if there is any eigenvalue with positive real part, we plot it. If there's nothing, it means that there's no such eigenvalue. So what you see here, there is a small region between mu linear and some larger value, mu critical, just here, for which there's no eigenvalue with positive real part, meaning you have linear stability. But for all other mu's, you always have eigenvalues with a positive part. Here's just, just one double eigenvalue, and from here they start a second eigenvalue. So you have stability until here, and now the million dollar question is what is the power here when you become unstable? Did you exceed the critical power or not? So the answer is no. The, the, you get this instability when the necklace power is one quarter of critical power. So you can say, oh, and that's not bad. So if each one of them is one quarter, you get a, but no. Together, they are one quarter of critical power. So each one of them is like 0 
So the good news is that this instability has nothing to do with collapse because you are well below the critical power for collapse. But the bad news is that, well, we started up to be better than the radial solitary waves. And we ended up being much worse because with radial, soli radial solitary waves, you can get up to critical power. Okay, let's look on the dynamics of this. Uh, so here we take this uh, solitary wave, we pretend we just this one we multiply by 1.05 and we let z go on, or t. This is from u slightly below critical and this is slightly above critical. And you see indeed that here it preserves the shape uh, until z equal 10, whereas here already at z equal 3 it, it's uh, unstable. So indeed you see this change of stability around new critical. It's not a blow up instability, but it's an instability nonetheless. <coughs> so now if you want, we want to still not to give up on this <coughs> necklace solitary waves, they look too promising. So we said, okay, maybe if we understand the source of this instability, we can be able somehow to fix it. So in order to do this, we need to understand what is the instability dynamics. And in order to understand, so if you look on the eigenvalue, you just get a yes, no answer, stable, unstable. If you want to understand the instability dynamics, then you need to look on the eigenfunctions <coughs> of these unstable modes. This tells you what is the instability <coughs> dynamics. Okay, so here are the eigenfunctions. So, for example, this is the eigenfunction the, 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 of uh, this line. So it corresponds to this, the first eigenvalue. Okay, you can look at it, but what do you see when you look at it? So the thing to see here, and that's why I plotted independently the real and imaginary uh, values and not just absolute. Uh, uh, so the things to see here is that this eigenvalue is anti-symmetric with respect to y, like the eigenfunction, like uh, the uh, solitary way, but is symmetric with respect to x. So what does it mean? It means that you start with this eigenfunction, which is anti-symmetric, but you add to it a symmetric perturbation. So the, both the result of this is that you see power shifts from one pearl to the other. So what this uh, eigenfunction tells you that this eigenfunction corresponds to power flow in the x direction. There is a second eigenfunction that corresponds to the same eigenvalue. It, this one has the symmetries of uh, its sim anti symmetric respect to x, but it's symmetric with respect to y. So, therefore, here you would have power flow in the y direction. And the third eigenfunction, the one that you start only here, has a, it's a symmetric with respect to x and y, so it means that power flow between all these four pearls. Okay, so uh, that was the point of a mile uh, display. Yeah. Uh, but uh, do, you, do you not expect that they are still periodic in time? Because when it's too big, then you start to go down and they will go up. Uh, yeah, there, there may be, well, they would oscillate somehow because it's confined. Yes. Uh, whether it's periodic in time... Oh, but this one. Uh, this one is stable. Uh, the, the, the full family. Mm -hmm. The full family is stable. The full family, which full family? Stationary plus periodic solution. Mm -hmm. You, you, you need to add more to have stability, more uh, mm. this time periodic. Uh, it's a good point, uh, actually, maybe. Uh, but this can yeah. be checked numerically. Yes, yes. We, we've seen sometimes that it's periodic in time, but uh, yeah, sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes no. I guess it depends on the perturbation. Okay. I can't help but say what there's several modes that interact. Why isn't it quasi periodic? Starting with. We saw three unstable modes, so why can't it have uh, uh, three, maybe four basic periods which interact with each other? Some of them resonant, because the, the y power shift and the x power shift have to be the, the same, but the uniform one, not necessarily. So 
That would be beautiful, but it's starting to get hard. What? Okay. Uh, so here it is that for stability, we have uh, this not as we expected. So we wanted to propagate more power in a stable way. So one uh, very intuitive idea would say, well, let's just use more pearls. Why use four? Let's use six, eight, 20. Or as long as it's an even number, that's fine. Well, it doesn't get you anywhere. Actually, the power of the whole necklace goes down as you increase the number of pearls. So a second idea would be to say, okay, so let's use a d another domain. So for example, if you use a, let's use a square with four pearls. So actually this would get you something. If you use a square domain, not with six, but as here, but with four, you, you, it, it, uh, the threshold power for stability jumps up by a factor of two, which was very surprising to us. I, didn't, I, I thought it would be almost the same as circle and a square, so I have no idea why is this factor of two. But still, this is well below what you have with radial solitary waves. So then we said, okay, but we know the source of the instability. The source of instability is the power flow between the different pearls. So we need somehow to be able to, uh, not to allow them to talk with each other. So the idea that we had is to use a annular domain, since if you put a hole inside, well, they can still speak with each other, but much less so. Okay, so this was our motivation to study the necklace solitaire wave on an annular domain. So here you see now the same plot that we had before, but now it's for a four pearls on an uh, annular necklace. And again, we plot the real value of omega as a function of mu. And it's very similar to before. You have this stability region up to mu critical. And surprisingly, we put here a hole, here the ratio of the small to large uh, radius was uh, one to two, and it had no effect on the threshold power. So the hole completely didn't help uh, to stabilize this uh, uh, necklace wave. This was when the student was really depressed. <laughs> uh, this was the bottom uh, of the, and there were many points of depression, but this was the worst. Uh, I was also depressed. But then we looked again and we saw, well, what do you see here? Here again, you have a stability regime. Here again, uh, at this large mu, you have a regime where you again have stability. And if you translate this second stability regime, you ask, what is the power here? Well, it's above three critical powers. So here, the whole tremendously help. You finally get a solitary which are stable. And just to show this numerically, so we take uh, these two cases. So one is a, a power, but in the un un unstable regime, it's this one, and this one is in the regime where it's predicted to be stable, and we add some noise here. So here you see this one, it starts here, and you see it's unstable. And this one, uh, oops, you see here, with the higher power, is actually stable. So uh, numerically, we do observe, now we have a stability regime uh, with ma much, much more than one critical power. And then the student started to smile. <laughs> and actually, uh, the annulus, or maybe more generally a non-convex domain, or a not a simply connected domain, is very interesting. Uh, if you look on this R equation, and you look for positive solutions, so now not necklace, now I look for radial, sol for just positive solution on the annulus. So I saw this R equation, I impose a, a positivity, and uh, I want to compute the ground state solutions or the positive solution. So it turns out that if you start at a low power, then you have radial solutions. 
These are the ground state solutions, the positive one. But there is some threshold value where you ha still have this radial solution, but they are not ground state anymore. You have a bifurcation here. Here you have a second family of non-radial solution that try to get localized more and more as you increase mu. So we have here a symmetry breaking uh, above a certain threshold. And this is not very surprising if you believe the variation or characterization of the ground state that you try to minimize the Hamiltonian. Clearly, at a certain point, it's easier to minimize it like this than using a radial form. But nevertheless, as far as I know, and uh, uh, this is the first case where we have a, a two different positive solutions of this R equation or a positive solution which is not a ground state. Uh, Frank, do you know of any example? That, uh, okay, you tell me. Okay. okay. <laughs> So actually, uh, this phenomena have been observed for the NLS with a potential for the inhomogeneous NLS, but not uh, in this paper, but not as far as I know for the pure NLS without the potential. So what about the stability here? So if you take this, uh, this uh, radial solution on the necklace, the radial solitary wave, then below this threshold is stable, this is how it started, this is how it behaves at z equal to 5. If you cross this threshold, then the radial solution is unstable, you see it tries to get, lo it tries to get localized, but above this threshold, the, actually the non-radial solution is stable, it doesn't change uh, with distance. Okay. What about, uh, how do you compute these solutions? So, uh, uh, you want to solve this R equation. In one dimension, it's easy. In, in higher dimension, it's more challenging because it's a nonlinear elliptic problem. Uh, and uh, worse, we cannot even use any radial symmetry or something like this because there's no symmetry here. And even worse, we look for a non-positive solution with a necklace structure. So how do we do this? So uh, uh, because we have this symmetry between the pearls, the goal is you just compute a single pearl which is positive and then extend it into a necklace. But how uh, would we compute this positive solution on a bounded domain? So actually when uh, when you are in a free space, there is a very simple method which basically is based on taking the Fourier transform of this, uh, of the, of this PDE, doing fixed point iteration, you do a simple rescaling and it converges beautifully. Very simple, 10 lines of code, all in the book. Uh, but you cannot do a Fourier transform here because it's a bounded domain. So it turns out actually that the, the Fourier is not the important part of this method. It, the, the normalization is the important part. So we just do this uh, uh, fixed point iteration, but with a non-spectral version. So what do we do? Here is the equation. We write the linear part here, uh, and then we can write it as fixed point iterations. If you just do this fixed point iteration, they always diverge either to zero or to infinity. So all you need is at each stage to do this simple rescaling uh, by some constant here in order to prevent this uh, divergence. And the way that you determine this constant is by requiring your solution to satisfy some integral identity which uh, R should satisfy. So for example, you can take this, multiply by R on both sides and integrate doesn't have to be this, this is just an example. And from this identity, you fix the value of CK at each iteration. And this is enough in order to compute all this solution. This is really a, an amazingly powerful method that works for positive solutions. And let me finish by saying that actually there is a very uh, whole analogy of this in one dimension. So when this was studied by a uh, Fukuzome, Haj Salem, and Kikuchi. So they looked in one dimension here for so multi-peak solutions, sign changing, which are 
maybe the equivalent of this uh, necklace solutions. Actually, they are uh, th this one-dimensional solution, they are both the analog of the radial ones, uh, which were studied previously, and the ones that we have now. And the theory in 1D and 2D is, uh, there are a lot of similarities. Okay, so in summary, we have a, a new type of solitary waves of a 2D NLS on bounded domains. Uh, the Threshold power for the necklace instability is a lot of time below the critical power of collapse. So this is instability which is not related to collapse. Uh, and uh, for the case of the annulus, we see that uh, miraculously there is a second stability regime where we can propagate uh, solitary waves with power well above the critical power. Uh, we see that the NLOS, the NLS on the NLOS has many interesting properties. There is a symmetry breaking here, there, and we saw the numerical method, and everything is in this paper. And thank you very much for your attention. Merci. Y a t des questions? Are there any questions? Yes, please. Sir? How do the vortex waves, I mean in a disk, vortex waves in disk, for practical purposes, how do they compete with the necklaces? Uh, vortex are unstable. In a disk? Uh, yes. Vortex are always azimutally unstable. We tried initially the vortex because uh, the critical power of the vortex is four times the power of uh, the solitary wave. So th it would have been great, but they are unstable. Um, further, further questions? Oh. Yes, uh, I'm just wondering about a simple thing. You, you see, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a bit related to the question about what uh, <coughs> You don't take the ground state, but the, the, the next one, the first excited state. The radial, you mean? Radial. Yeah, first excited. That is, so the, the change sign. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so he, he has. Uh, so so it's a mix uh, between uh, the, the vortex and mm. the... Okay. Well, you do the things with four, let's say. Mm. But for everything uh, else, so have you tried to do something like that? Uh, so four, where each one is the, the exciter? Yeah, yeah, for each one, uh, this one are unstable, mm. yes. Yes, so you have the same problem. Yeah, I want stability. Yeah. Okay. Although the, the excited states are stable on bounded domain at low power, yes, but, but we want high power. High power. Mm -hmm. But there is a competition. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I had a question about uh, the restabilization, where you mm -hmm. have a very tiny interval of red for low mu and then this big deviation and then it restabilizes. Um, when in the restabilizing regime, the um, your solitary waves, it's the same, of course, uh, ang uh, sectorial decomposition, but they're very much more localized. And so could you say that their stabilization is related to their separation? The, the, the annulus domain walls are keeping them very well separated. Uh, I thought a lot about this and I don't have a good answer. Uh, because they cannot be too localized, because if they are too localized, then it's like, bare li like free space. So they're unstable by themselves, each one. Uh, on the other hand, when they are too uh, non-localized, then it's unstable as well. So there is this re regime where they are uh, mildly localized. But why I try to, we try to see whether we can say something more intelligent than that, and we couldn't, I mean, to somehow get some better intuition why you get it there, and I'm sure there is, but we didn't find it. For example, you have small region of red, but then instability, then a large region of red, that's very mm -hmm. nice, and then instability. There's no more region of red higher than that, is there? 
Just not that we know, that. not that we know if we checked. I mean, I can never say, but uh, we didn't spot any. Right. And then how about if you have very high many sector sectors, like a, really a necklace, does the second region of red exist and does it, is it a nice big, big one? Or how, how does it go? If I wanted to get a, a, a necklace of pearls through mm -hmm. a lot of atmosphere, mm -hmm. should I make very many sectors? You succeed in... Uh, so let... Let me tell you what's the problem. The student graduated. So uh, there, were ma there are many good questions that I want to answer. Next but uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, the, actually the, the key thing would be to get an experimentalist to do this. And trying to, so I, uh, it's not easy. Uh, and the main problem, so we have simulation which are very convincing, but the problem is that when you do the experiment, you have a limited control over your initial uh, conditions. So you cannot make it exactly like this R. Right. It has some shape. So then the question, how can you find an initial condition that using uh, experimental techniques, how do you induce the necklace? That's actually easy because you can put the phase place, which would make the plus minus plus minus. But then how do you make initial condition which is sufficiently close so that you will get a necklace at the high power? So at the low power, they were able to observe these necklaces uh, numerically. But at high power, you are always, if you are unstable, you will have col collapse. And so uh, I would say if the experimentalist would come, then the student would also come to do this. So I, I know this is very, very, there are tons of questions that I want to ask. Whether you can play even in the rectangular way, whether you can have some sort of weird shapes that would give you more than more power, I don't know. It's open. Okay, no further questions. Thank you again. Very well.